Hello, good morning, and uh, thank you for joining today's uh, webinar, Why Leading Global Businesses Run Nest with ERP. Um, my name is Vishwit Parikh, and I am uh, Director of Product Marketing here at NetSuite. I'll discuss the shift that we are seeing in companies moving to cloud technology and cloud ERP. What are the drivers behind this shift? Why global companies, whether small or large, are relying on cloud and specifically on NetSuite Cloud ERP to make the move? We also have Fran Delaney with us. Fran is a Principal Solution Consultant at NetSuite. Fran will do a live demo of world's most deployed cloud ERP solution for global businesses, NetSuite One World. For those of you who are not familiar with NetSuite, NetSuite is the world's number one cloud ERP provider used by over 20,000 organizations worldwide. We have over 2,700 employees, and we are a publicly traded company. We have experienced a tremendous growth over the last couple of years. Our revenues have grown over 30% year over year. As you can see, world's large leading organizations have standardized their business operations on NetSuite Cloud ERP, right from Roku to Girl Scouts, Qualcomm, they all use NetSuite Cloud ERP. You know, one thing is for sure is change. Your business is the Business in the past was probably fairly predictable and stable, but that is no longer the case today. You have to be agile enough to respond to ra rapidly changing market conditions before your competition does. For example, new business models are emerging every day. Companies that were, build companies that were building products are morphing into develop delivering those products as services. B2C retailers are moving into B2B channels. B2B distributors are going online into B2C space. In this landscape, agility is a must. To offer successfully in a changing business and economic environment, your business needs to be flexible, and uh, flexibility is crucial for your business. To stay competitive, a global view is required. Whether you, are, whether you have international customers, warehouses, manufacturing facilities, or source raw material from global market, you are operating in a global environment. You need to be able to quickly assess and understand local markets, conditions, and adapt for global impact those can have on your business. And then there's new technology that impacts everyone's expectation. Your customer expects to be able to reach you from their mobile phone, on Facebook, on Twitter. Your distributors are looking to engage with you the same way. How do, you provide that how do you provide that platform? And finally, employee engagement is essential to continue success. As you, as you expand globally and adopt new business models, your workforce is increasingly distributed and decentralized. How do you make sure your employees are engaged? You need to have new technology platform that enables you to do that. One, the bottom line is that you can't address today's challenges and constant state of change if your business system looks like this. We talk to a lot of businesses, we talk to a lot of prospects, a lot of customers, and when we present this slide, we see people nodding their head in the audience. Uh, Excel is everyone's favorite res reporting tool and spreadsheets around across all departments. Your IT is busy integrating all these different systems and not providing any value added to your business. Is that how you want to leverage your resources? That's a question that you need to ask. Through no fault of your own, you have, en you, you have ended up with systems that makes it near impossible to embrace a changing business environment of today. You can't do that. You cannot be agile when your environment looks like, like this. The reality of on-premise solutions is that according to Forrester, uh, there are hidden costs of on-premise ERP that to be five times the cost of license and implementation. License costs are all upfront costs. The total cost of the hardware required, middleware implementation, database licenses adds up to significant investment without actually realizing benefit for a long time. A lot of ERP deployments are version locked. According to Aberdeen Group, 66% of companies are running on old versions of financials, avoiding daunting and expensive up, up, upgrades. All the customizations made needs to be upgraded and tested. Are you ready to do that? 
when you don't do that, you're draining innovation. According to Gartner, 90% of the IT budget is spent on maintenance and administration of the apps compared to innovation within the organization, just keeping the lights on. And lastly, traditional ERP systems are fragmented. For example, point solutions are deployed for financial support, sales, warehousing, e-commerce, and none of them can talk to each other, or you have to have huge IT budget to make sure the integrations work. And this is also the reality, that uh, is your version like the legacy ERP vendor forcing you into an expensive, complicated, and disruptive upgrade? There are, there, these are just two examples for Microsoft just announced end of support for Windows Server 2003. Oracle announced you have, uh, if you are on a less, uh, if you you have a less than a year, if you are running Oracle eBusiness Suite 11.x, you must move to 12.x. Is this a reality for you? Is that what you're experiencing with cloud-based solutions? This is eliminated. You don't need to worry about the upgrades. You don't. You're not in. Ver you're not version locked. You no longer are dependent on vendor schedules. Cloud vendors like NetSuite upgrades you twice, per, twice a year automatically. It's no surprise that the cloud is gaining momentum. Living organizations are realizing that they have to move the needle. They need to adopt new ways of consuming applications and move away from spending 80% of the IT budget to keep the lights on. IDC is forecasting that through 2015, that cloud deployments are going to going to go up by four times the rate of the broader IT market. Businesses are choosing cloud computing at much faster rate than the traditional solutions. Are you ready to embrace this change? Gartner surveyed CIOs and asked them about the key technology areas that they are considering over the next few years, and cloud is the number one priority. You cannot ignore these trends. You have to leverage the latest and greatest technology that's available to you. And if you're running a global business, on top of that, you are running, um, you have additional challenges. You've got, you have new initiatives going on in Brazil, China, India, etc. These markets tend to be your fastest growth markets, and you are getting incredible demands from the country managers in those areas saying, hey, I need to, I need a system tomorrow. I can't wait 18 months for us to bring the corporate instance of Oracle or whatever that case it may be, SAP, down here. I need that today. How are you going to respond to the need? And this is exactly where NetSuite One World fits in. Multi-company, multi-currency capability is perfect for your international operations. NetSuite One World is a proven solution for managing your global business. Customers today have deployed NetSuite One World in over 160 countries transacting with their customers and suppliers in over 200 countries and independent territories. It enables businesses to adjust for currency, taxation, and legal compliance differences at, a loc at the local level. With the regional and global businesses con consolidation and roll-ups by providing support for over 190 currencies and providing user interfaces in 19 languages, we have designed a system to meet your requirement for most globally diverse companies. You will be able to see this in a demonstration that Fran will do a little bit later. You know the challenge with multi-company consolidation. Once you put multiple systems in all these countries, it's impossible to do the consolidation in, in the operational system. That's how complex it is. You build a cloud-based system with ability to run multinational, multi-company subseries in a single instance of NetSuite. This allows us to consolidate those subs in NetSuite in real time. The data model is never fragmented. It is, it's very simple for us to consolidate in real time of the core operational data. It's very difficult to achieve with the on-premise solution when you have a fragmented systems all over the place. You will see this in demo as well. As you expand globally, and you have workers that are coming in experiencing doing, doing things on mobile phones, they expect the same exact experience with your, with your ERP. You want to know in real time how my business is doing. You don't want to be uh, waiting for to get to the laptop or computer before you can find out. You want to know that at any time you want to have access to the data that, you, that matters to you. 
you want to be mobile. Of course, you, you have a distributed workforce, outsourcing worker. You, you have outsourced part of your business operation. You need to be able to connect to them. You need to be able to give them devices and access on the devices of their, that, of their choice. Are you able to do that? With a cloud ERP and cloud solution, you are able to provide access anytime, anywhere. And on top of that, with the limited IT budget that you have, you're able to make them self-serve, in a sense, giving an easy-to-use user interface, easy-to-use a consumer type of application and dashboards. They can self-serve. They're not relying on IT to make their own dashboards. One quick example is Shaw Industries. This is a Berkshire Hathaway company. This is a quote from them. Because NetSuite is in the cloud, we can enter new markets faster. We are very confident NetSuite will seamlessly support our growth outside of North America. Shaw Carpet or Shaw Industries has standardized on NetSuite across the globe for any new offices, any new manufacturing in the, uh, uh, facilities that they open outside of North America. They're using NetSuite to, for supporting their growth. And lastly, not only us saying that, but Gartner also has recognized that uh, NetSuite is the fast as the vendor who is growing market share the fastest globally for for the top ten financial management system. NetSuite is the top, fastest growing vendor in a financial management software worldwide. And this is not us saying that, but this is Gartner is saying that. And we are actively taking market share away from established vendors such as SAP, Oracle, and Sage, as you can see uh, on this uh, on this chart. It's, not, it's no surprise that companies across industries have, used, have standardized their operations on NetSuite, whether it's a software company, WD, manufacturing services, e-tail, retail, or large enterprises. They have all realized the benefit of NetSuite and understanding how cloud can transform their business away from uh, legacy on-premise ERP, the benefit it can bring. And as you can see, that many, many business sample lists of customers that have standardized their operations on NetSuite. With this, I'm going to hand it over to Fran Delaney, who's going to give us a live demonstration of NetSuite One World. Fran? Okay. Um, as Vishnu mentioned, I, I'm a solution consultant here at NetSuite, and I'm associated with our software vertical. A solution consultant at NetSuite is an ex-implementation consultant that now supports the sales and marketing team, so I do demonstrations like this fairly frequently. Um, before I get into the actual application, I just wanted to give you an idea of NetSuite's approach to the user interface. Um, we're completely dashboard based and we're role based. So depending on what your individual role is um, using a NetSuite application, you can run the gamut of um, getting tactical items on your menu, so things like shortcuts or specific menu items, for example, to go enter a journal entry. Or if you're a little bit more strategic in nature in your job, you can get things like key performance indicators, trend reports, that type of thing. Um, we see very many of our companies having folks that have access to both. So they actually do transactional information. They actually get access to strategic information. Depending on the administrative permissions allowed by your company, um, that will drive what each individual role will have access to. The demonstration environment that I'm going to be in is the One World environment, so it's a multinational, multi-level roll-up company. So we have corporate headquarters in this version uh, based in the U.S. where their base currency is the U.S. dollar, but we have various subsidiaries, and again, it's multiple levels. So we have an EMEA um, subsidiary, but then with subsidiaries underneath EMEA in Germany, U.K., and Denmark. Um, in this specific scenario, base currency equals local currency, but we also support processes where there may be a single currency across the entire entity and then, you know, remeasurement may be required. Um, again, in this particular entity, we have the global parent and then EMEA, Asia PAC, and Americas underneath that, and then sub-subsidiaries underneath that. And I'll walk through some specific examples. One of the takeaways, though, from this process that's unique to NetSuite is these roll-ups are going to be done on a real-time basis. So I'll get into the details, but the idea here is, is that you can enter a transaction at the low level, lowest level subsidiary. So in the UK, for example, you can enter a transaction in the British pound that will immediately roll up to the parent. So real-time visibility will be available across the enterprise. And I'll show you a specific example of how that happens in a moment. 
just from a localization perspective with regards to currency, NetSuite supports pretty much every currency known to man. Um, if a new country comes into being with specific countries breaking out or anything like that, um, those currencies can be added immediately within NetSuite. Um, the rates are updated within NetSuite from uh, the source is a company called Morningstar based over in the UK, and that would be part of your subscription. And we are FASB 52 compliant. So on an individual account basis, you assign whether it's going to be a current rate, an average rate, or a historical rate for consolidation purposes. Now one of the things that NetSuite also supports is tax support by country. Now one of the things here is most folks look at this and say, okay, great, that's, that's going to be tax rates for the individual countries. But NetSuite does much, much more in those scenarios. Each one of these 54 countries that are supported today have all of the localized statutory requirements supported. So, you know, specifically say in France, for example, there's a statutory chart of accounts in France that needs to be required for local reporting. NetSuite can support that. Um, in places like Germany, there's specific invoice requirements. Again, as part of these tax support, it's not just the tax rates that NetSuite delivers, but also all of the statutory requirements there. And we'll get into a couple examples of that as well. If you do business in a country that's not necessarily on this list, it doesn't mean that NetSuite doesn't support it. The actual tax rates are fairly easy to import into the system, and then we do have a number of partners that can support some of the localized tax requirements in countries that they're not on this listing. The last thing before we jump into the actual demonstration is Vishrut mentioned, today we support 19 languages. The one takeaway on this is that this is not done on a subsidiary or a country basis. On an individual basis, um, an individual can determine what language they'd like to see the forms in. Um, and again, this is with the administrative permissions allowing that to happen. I, I'm based in the San Francisco Bay Area and it's diversity personified right here. So if there happened to be somebody that was more comfortable looking at their forms in their native language and from an administrative perspective, you would allow that person permission to change their language, they can actually change the forms and look at it in their native language. Okay? With that said, I'm going to jump into the actual presentation now. And what I'd like to do is just make sure we get out here and share everything. Okay, full screen, Vishu? Yes, we are able to be full screen. Thank you, friend. Beautiful, thank you. So those of you who have never seen NetSuite before, or even those that you have had, I'll notice a couple things that should be noted. So NetSuite is completely browser-based. Um, I'm using Google Chrome, but again, any internet browser is supported. We're browser agnostic, um, you know, up to including any kind of Apple. So if you're a Safari person, um, it's supported, Internet Explorer, Firefox, what have you. Um, one of the things to note if you have seen exper had experience with NetSuite is with the release of 2014.2 versioning, um, we changed the user interface to be a little bit more modern and, and clean looking. So again, if you've seen NetSuite before, you should notice a change there. Um, I've signed on as a global CFO. So you'll see up in the upper right hand corner, we're role based. So as part of this process, we can actually go through and depending on what your job function is, you can have access to multiple permissions. So for one world, I'm going to look at it from a global perspective. But for example, if you're a controller of just a single subsidiary or even a collection specialist or even a, what I'll call a lightweight user experience, we can roll things out to individual employees for entering things like expense reports and purchase requisitions. Again, I mentioned a little bit earlier is NetSuite's a real-time environment. So even though I am signed on as this global CFO, all of the information I'm looking at is real-time. All right? Um, if I select the subsidiary navigator, this is a tool that was recently added. So as a global CFO, I have access across all of the subsidiaries based on my, uh, my dashboard. One of the things, though, you'll notice is this is the actual corporate structure we have in place. Um, the subsidiary navigator allows me to actually look across a global perspective or if I wanted to just focus on a single subsidiary and I'm going to click on the UK, you'll notice immediately all of these um, screens are going to populate now and we're looking specifically at the UK. So if I scroll down to some key performance indicators and look at things like an income statement, um, 
new customer listing, that type of thing. Even here, you'll notice that the um, currency now has changed to British pounds since that's the base currency in that UK subsidiary. Very cool aspect to hone in on certain aspects of your business, again, in a real-time basis. At the touch of a button, I can go back up, look at the global perspective again. Now I'm looking at all of my subsidiaries. And again, just by hitting that subsidiary navigator bar, I can make the most um, advantage of my real estate on my dashboard by hiding that piece. So just at a touch of a button, I can focus on individual subsidiaries, but at the same time, I can look globally across your entire organization. A couple things to note. So, you know, my background is accounting. Um, typically, I like to look at numbers, but you do have the ability to have graphical representations pushed out here. You can determine. You know, I'm based in our software vertical, so subscriptions are a big thing. So if somebody wants to look at things like annual recurring revenue, they have that aspect. They can look at it under any type of time frame as well. So ARR is a specific uh, stat that we look at. But again, you can look at it across multiple um, time frames. So if I want to look at it monthly, quarterly, or yearly, I can do that at a touch of a button. Okay? If I scroll down, you'll see different things here. So as part of this screen, I have specifically here, I have something called a SAS metric scorecard. So think of software as a service, something specific to what NetSuite does. You know, we've rolled these things out, and you look at this, and as part of this process, you can see specific measurements that are out here that are important to a software company. If you wanted to look at what the average selling price is, you can look at it over various periods, but then at the same time, by selecting that button, you can actually even see where that calculation has come from. Now, this is specific to somebody that's in a software company. You also have the ability from a flexibility perspective to go out and change this type of thing. So maybe you know, you're more of a traditional company. You can actually go out and look at something like a global financial ratio. Just as a touch of a button now, I can actually replace this graphic that was specific to a SAS metrics and look at more traditional global financial ratios. So things like current ratio, receivables turnover, DSO. If I want to look at DSO, same idea here is I can hover over this piece, select it, and again, it will actually tell me what that calculation is. So we have a DSO of 64 days for the current period, and it's based on sales of 20 million divided by receivables of 43. And even looking at the experience you're looking over, it's a 30-day window. A lot of people might want to look at DSO over a longer period, maybe change that piece to 90 days. Very easy within the application for an end user or an accountant to go in and change these metrics, make it easier to see for the individual. Okay? Being in the One World application also, though, we also have, you know, instead of, you know, retroactively getting information after it's happened, there's also a workflow manager that permeates all of NetSuite. You know, a perfect example may be in this global entity, if I hover over on the left-hand side, you'll see I have intercompany journals to approve. So as this global CFO, occasionally I might have to play referee across the board. Um, maybe there's going to be some cost transfers from one country to another. In a typical environment, those don't always go so smoothly, so perhaps this global CFO might have to play referee. The workflow manager can drive these processes so that you can proactively drive your business. Um, again, workflow can be driven not just for an approval process, but it can help with any type of processes. Things like an invo invoice collection workflow can be driven where the system can automate the collection process. Sending out dunning letters, even go as far as putting you know, very tardy customers on credit hold if it's required. Um, there's always exceptions built within workflow, so if you have a class A customer, that you don't ever want to bother, that can be exempted from those workflow processes. You'll notice there's a navigation portlet as well. Um, these are frequently accessed fields, you know, similar to a shortcut. So as a CFO, I may be looking, you know, very involved in currency rates, for example. Um, can look at various subsidiaries. Even, you know, just things like in, in the software vertical, revenue recognition is always important. So I might want to go out and review certain aspects. But sticking with the same idea of being very flexible in this process, at any point in time within these navigation portlets, I can actually go out and change things. Okay, so if I wanted to look at various dashboards, go out to different things, I can determine what's going to be included in this navigation portlet. 
Um, you know, just an example of the flexibility built within the system. Now, to show you, I mentioned that I'm signed on as that global CFO. I'm looking at all of this information, and it's from a global perspective. So you'll notice under my key performance indicators, um, out of the box, NetSuite delivers approximately 75 key performance indicators. You know, as a CFO, I'm looking at traditional financial information. I want to see P&L information, perhaps a bank balance, what my receivables or payables look like. Now, the idea here is you'll notice that there's some pieces here that are bolded, okay? I've set up thresholds, and you'll notice that we have a, a fairly big variation here. Is part of this process now, I can actually drill down from here and say, okay, these bolded areas might be of interest to me. It's good news that net income for this particular month is up 75% over the previous period. For these purposes, though, before I go running and sending this out to my board of directors, for example, I can drill down and look at various components here. Okay? If I look at this, I drill down to an income statement, okay? Fairly innocuous income statement. You know, revenue categories, cost of sales, so on and so forth. But for these purposes, I also have the ability to go filter these pieces. So if I want to look at it by any segment of my chart of accounts, I can do that. In this particular case, I'm going to look at it, though, as a global CFO, I want to look at it from a subsidiary perspective, okay? Now, by just selecting that column phrase, I can actually now go refresh this and now I'm looking at that P&L. Total pieces on the right-hand side are across your entire entity, but now at this point in time, I can actually look through it and see it by individual countries. So I can look over the America subsidiary, the Asia-Pac subsidiary, as well as EMEA, and even go down to the individual country subsidiary. So for these purposes, I'll focus on something like the United Kingdom. Okay? You'll notice here that there's various components. I'm still at the enterprise level, so I'm looking at this in U.S. dollars in summary level. You'll notice as I hover over the certain number for software, license, and subscription, it's asking me if I want to look at detail. Again, I can drill down from here, look at the source transactions that are driving that piece. So I've driven down, see various transactions that are coming through. As you would expect under a revenue category, we have, I have a number of sales transactions. Okay? In this particular case, these are software licenses, perpetual, that will be recognized immediately. You'll also notice that there's journal entries there. For example, if it happened to be a subscription that needed to be recognized ratably over the period of that subscription, that will also roll up on a real-time basis. Since I'm looking at this from a headquarters perspective, it's still going to be in U.S. dollars. But at any point in time, if I wanted to go into the source currency, I'm going to scroll down, select the U.K., and then refresh this screen, you'll see this same 96,000 U.S. dollars has now been translated to 60,000 British pounds. I, I rounded off the exchange rates fairly closely there so that most accountants can do it in their head. But you'll realize now that I'm looking at 60,000 British pounds as a source transaction with a customer called Gabriel Solutions. Now from here, I can even drill down from the parent perspective and drill down and actually get into the source subsidiary, if you will. So as I drill down from here, that 60,000 British pounds, we're going to see now that we actually have the source transaction, the invoice. Gabriel Solutions is the customer. You'll notice if I hover over in the lower left-hand corner now, I've actually drilled down to that source subsidiary. I'm now in the United Kingdom, okay? Um, the currency we're transacting in is the British pound, because that's going to be typical of what the transactions may be in that subsidiary. Now, NetSuite does support transactions across the globe. So even if this subsidiary was based in the U.K. and their base currency is in the British pound, it doesn't preclude them from transacting in U.S. dollars, Japanese yen, or the Singapore dollars. Again, that is fully supported. But in this particular case, just as an example, we're drilling down. You'll notice furthermore now, we've drilled into the UK subsidiary, so now you'll notice from a tax code perspective, we're looking at that. So again, drill from that US parent where some of the US transactions will be subject to you know, IRS regulations and US tax code you know, from an individual state perspective. In this particular case now, you'll notice that the VAT code is being driven here. So, you know, that 20% tax automatically calculated. And again, this is built within the system. Now, a little bit earlier I mentioned that NetSuite actually supports tax localizations. And again, 
the tax rates are going to be included in that, but what's also included, if I drill into this other tab, you'll notice that a couple different things. In the UK, that filing is required to be done online. It's not like doing 1099s in the US where you have to meet a certain threshold before it's filed electronically. There's no choice in the UK. So as part of our tax localization offering, we actually deliver this online tax form. Okay? So Her Majesty's Revenue and Custom is, is the UK equivalent of the IRS. You'll notice here all of these transactions are actually, you'll see the VAT due. You'll see the basis for that VAT, which is based on sales numbers. All of these are drill downable. So if you want to see the source driving that process, but then this form is actually delivered so that we can submit this online. And for these purposes, I'm not going to select the button. But the idea here is that we can actually drive this so that delivered as part of the process specific to, in this case, the UK, if there's a re regulatory requirement in the UK that this be filed online, that's supported. Okay? Now, the one thing you might want to ask, and I'll just touch on it briefly, is you'll notice in this particular case we're using a perpetual software license, okay? Revenue is going to be recognized immediately. Think of it if you are selling a widget or some physical item, or in this case a perpetual item, okay? It's going to be recognized immediately, which is why it was showing up on the P&L. That 60,000 British pounds was rolling up into the U.S. parent. Now, built into the system are a consolidated exchange rate table. Okay, so I'm going to populate that and just kind of show you. One of the things you'll notice now, in accordance with FASB 52, I, I rounded these. Again, the 60,000 British pounds is looking at the average rate since it's a P&L item, saying it's $1.60. It's going to roll up. That's how this got to be $96,000 today. So from a real-time perspective, you can look at it right now. Now, you might ask, you know, during the course of the month, there's going to be currency fluctuation. Very cool part within NetSuite, those transactions rolling up to the parent level are available real time, but they are subject to fluctuation throughout the month. So as part of our month end close process, as these rates change, for example, if that 60,000 British pounds was going to roll up and we're at September 30th, and the average rate over the course of the month had changed to $1.50, that $96,000 transaction at, at the parent level would transform into 90,000 U.S. dollars. As part of the month end close process, <clears throat> these rates will be locked down, but it's the best of both worlds. You do have the controls. You do have it in accordance to, you know, all the available accounting guidance, whether it be U.S. or anything along those lines. But as part of this process, we do have the controls in place at the end of the month where these things can be locked down as well. Okay? Just wanted to touch on that briefly. Now, the last thing before we finish up here is I wanted to go back just for a second, and I'm going to go back out and share PowerPoint because one of the things that we've come up with lately is what we call our multi-book functionality. Okay? Now, what is multi-book? Multi-book gives you the ability to support global operations from an accounting vantage point. So people will hear of things like, you know, U.S. GAAP, but they'll also hear about IFRS, You'll also hear about statutory reporting. The ability of multi-book allows folks to run multiple sets of financial books in parallel. So the accounting books will be driven so that you can actually have transactions supported, again, for different accounting purposes. The one takeaway here is how this works. There will be a single business transaction entered once within the system and then assigned based on different accounting rules um, will drive it to different accounting books. So if you think about a subsidiary that may be based, say, in France or in Germany, okay, they might have local statutory requirements. Okay? Even if, since it's a subsidiary, it's still going to need to roll up to the U.S. parent in my environment. So the idea here is you'll notice that this single transaction will be entered. It will be treated one way for GAAP rules so that when it rolls up to the parent level, it will be treated in accordance to U.S. GAAP. It also can be driven to accounting rules based on local statutory guidance. That will drive into a separate set of accounting books for local statutory requirements. And then if they fall under the, the regards to something like IFRS, the same idea can happen. Now, the takeaway from this, 
a single business transaction, and it'll feed out to different accounting books for different purposes. And let, let me give you a brief example of how that would work. Okay. Make sure we're doing the same share here again. Go to full screen. Okay. Now I'm going to sign on on our multi-book environment. Okay. Now you'll notice when we look up here, there's something called a primary accounting book. Okay. If I hover over that, you'll notice it gives you different opportunities. So primary accounting book in my scenario is a U.S. corporation that's going to be under the, the guidance of U.S. GAAP. But we do have the ability to set up multiple accounting books. Okay. So something like if, for example, you actually had all of your subsidiaries based in the USD and you need to do remeasurement process, we can actually set up a separate book for that. Fall under the guidance of IFRS or some type of statutory book, that can be supported as well. For these purposes, I'm actually going to go back into that same income state that we we're looking at. Okay? Drill down, and again, same income statement that we have available, but now I'm going to look at it again across multiple subsidiaries, and then I'm going to focus on India. Okay? So India is one of those pieces under Asia Pack where we're looking at this in accordance to U.S. GAAP rules because we're at the parent level and we're in the primary accounting book. For these purposes, I'm going to drill down, look at the transactions here. So again, for these purposes, I'm going to focus on this $500,000 transaction with a customer called Introspective Solutions. When I drill down from here, you'll see now we're going to get into an India subsidiary. Okay? Currency is now going to be the Indian rupee, which is, you know, I think approximately 60 rupees to the U.S. dollar. So the dollar amounts are, are very large. Now, in this particular case, we're doing revenue reallocation in accordance with U.S. GAAP, okay? Um, so there are going to be accounting guidelines saying that this is a software environment, so since we're giving away a maintenance contract, we have to do revenue reallocation. Now, not so much the actual accounting rules here, but if you look at this, um, I'm going to go look at the GL impact. Drill down here, and you'll notice now in accordance to this, we have 39,000 uh, rupees for accounts receivable. Again, in accordance with GAAP and under the guidance of SOP 97-2, basically saying that we have to do revenue reallocation, okay, in accordance to U.S. GAAP. So we're taking things based on things like VSOE and some of those other terms that you've heard of before and basically saying we have to reallocate this revenue for those software license, and now it's being reallocated to a dollar amount of 30 million rupees. Okay? This is for the primary accounting book, which would be U.S. GAAP. Now, if we look at another accounting book, which might be for local statutory requirements or, or IFRS based over in India, if I select that now, you'll notice the accounting is quite different. It's still going to be accounts receivable, but for these purposes, we're assuming the accounting guidelines are very conservative in saying, you know what, even though this is a perpetual license, there's an implementation vantage point associated with it, and we're going to say all of that has to be put out on the balance sheet into deferred income. Okay? Just different aspects here. We have different accounting rules can be applied, but a single entry will be entered into the system. This is some new functionality that's come out in the last six months within NetSuite, and it's fairly unique to NetSuite. And the takeaway here is from a global perspective, we let you support global operations with specific statutory requirements by country um, and allow different accounting rules to be associated with that. You will support your parent level accounting rules. So in this particular case, we have U.S. GAAP but also every country that you do business in will also be supported, whether it be under the IFRS guidelines or whether there's just some statutory rules that are supported in each individual country as well. Okay? So I just wanted to give you a brief overview. You could spend a fair amount of time in multi-book. But again, the takeaway from that is single transaction, and it can be treated differently in multiple accounting books for different reasons. Okay? With that said, I think from the, the product demonstration, that's kind of about what I wanted to cover, and I think we have a few minutes set aside for specific Q&A. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Vishu. Yes, friend. If you can just go back to the slides, that would be great. Thank you for that demonstration. 
Right. For those of you wanting to ask questions, please do so via Q and A uh, panel on your WebEx. Um, friend, there is a question. I think this maybe you can help us uh, help us with this question. Um, how often currency rates are updated, and who controls that? They're updated on a well. The, the customer controls it, so there's options of how often and, and when it can be bought in. Typically, it's bought in on a daily basis, and and again, the customer can determine the time frame. Also, as part of that process, on a currency basis, though, they can pick different times. So it may make sense, for example, to have the euro or the British pound be updated at time for Greenwich Mean Time, you know, at, say, midnight. Whereas if you're based on the west coast of the United States, the U.S. dollar might be updated on Pacific time. And then if you're based over in Asia Pac, it might be on the local time there. So again, the customer has a, a fair amount of latitude of when those rates can be updated. And again, they can be updated differently by currency. Okay, I want to be clear on that. Not necessarily country, but currency. Okay. All right. Thank you, Frank. Um, so another question says, can we start with NetSuite in U.S. only and then add international capabilities when uh, we experience the growth or when we go international? Uh, so I'm going to just uh, answer that question. Friend can add that in a little bit later. Of course, yeah, that is correct. You can definitely start uh, using NetSuite in U.S. only and then add international capabilities as you see it uh, as in when you need it. Um, so that's, a lot of our customers do that. I mean, they experience tremendous growth, and then they go international, or they look for uh, uh, suppliers or do manufacturing internationally, and then they can add um, the one world module that Trent just showed us. They can add that afterwards. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and Vishir, if I could just add upon that, though, there is a certain strategy depending on time frame. So you can start with U.S. only. We typically see about a year window that if, if you plan on expanding globally within a year, you might want to consider starting with One World because obviously there's you know some sophistication or slash complication as far as the initial setup. So again, there's certain time frames that you probably want to think about that if you're going to expand globally in any near time time frame, you might want to sit there and, and consider using the One World product right from the start. But again, as Vishroot mentioned, it can be added on later. Uh, there's a question about multi-book, Fran. Uh, maybe you can answer that. In regards to multi-book, is there a limit to number of books you can set up? Yes, right now there's five books per subsidiary. Okay, so you know, when I mention that, it's things like in this particular case, we have GAP in, in, on the slide I'm looking at. There's GAP, there's local statutory, and then there's IFRS. So if you had multiple subsidiaries, and I'll just use France, Germany, and India, okay, the statutory book um, would be one book, but obviously it's going to be a little bit different from France and Germany and India. So again, right now there's a limit of five. But again, they're broad categories, so that statutory would be statutory by subsidiary, so different accounting rules. All right. Um, so question about uh, how Nestle supports the growing use of and security concerns for BYOD. Well, as, uh, that, let me try to answer that question, Trent. Um, so as, as specifically as it relates to BYOD, I mean, we are not an MDM uh, solution provider, so that's not what we do. But as far as the NetSuite applications on iPhone, uh, we have an app on iPhone that you can download from the App Store that is completely secured within the framework of the security that's provided with any, any other app. But as far as the BYOD, uh, you would actually just leverage the vendor that you're using for your other mobile devices management. Okay. Um, all right, there are one more question. What is the typical timeline for conversation transition to NetSuite of a small to medium-sized company, let's say from QuickBooks? I'll, I'll take a shot at that, but I have, I have to give it the typical caveat that it's always going to depend on everybody's individual situation. Um, we do see windows of time falling, you know, if, if it's very accelerated and people had to get up and running, it can be relatively quickly. But we typically see a minimum of, you know, a four to eight month window. Um, and again, lots of caveats wrapped around that. 
And the flip side as well is that with that window of time, it's typically because people transitioning specifically into something like a one world have their day jobs to do, so it's not necessarily a full-time implementation. A lot of our emerging companies don't necessarily have the, uh, the bandwidth to actually support the full-time implementation and allocate people full-time. So again, it's going to depend on everybody's individual situation, um, but just as a broad spectrum, you know, that, that might be a guideline to look at. Thanks, Brent. Uh, there's a question that each business and customer has unique business processes. How easy it is to, cust to do the customization and personalizations within NetSuite? Um, relatively easy. NetSuite obviously browser-based, so it's not like some of the older school applications. Um, the screens can be customized to meet individual needs. Uh, fields can be added if they don't exist. Um, there's that workflow engine that I mentioned can actually drive business processes based on every individual business process. Um, again, NetSuite's architected where most of the functionality is intended to have the functional user. So in this case, the accountant should be able to go out and do a lot of this stuff, not necessarily require programming. So again, it's not an absolute that everything can be done by the end user, but a good chunk of things that have traditionally been done by programming and IT, it's been transitioned to where the end user can do that, all falling under the auspices of, of the company's specific security and permissions administration. Again, that's kind of key because um, while it does provide great flexibility, you don't want to allow, you know, pretty much everybody to be running around willy-nilly and then, you know, you have a little bit of chaos. So there's some planning uh, to be thinking of and there will be a system administrator on each individual customer side. Um, but again, the flexibility is great. Perfect. And uh, just to add to Fran's uh, answers that, you know, we do have a role-based uh, security as well. So whatever the roles that you have given to a particular user, you'll be able to see what it, what you have determined that they have access to. So we have all this uh, that you can personalize the application that way. And uh, one thing to add about customization is that w the nice thing with NetSuite and the, uh, because it's in cloud and we do the upgrades for you, you don't have to worry about the upgrades unlike the on-premise solutions like Microsoft Dynamics or any other on-premise solution that you may have that we do the upgrades for you, all the customizations that you have done gets upgraded automatically. And so that's the, uh, you don't have to worry about that. It's something that we take care of as a vendor of a cloud ERP provider. We take care of that. So you just focus on running your business. We take care of all the back end and infrastructure needs that you may have for running your business. And uh, once the upgrades are done, we give you access to the environment where you can test the customization before it goes into production. So there's a whole process around how the upgrades are done, but the best part is that that's something that we take care of, not you. There are a couple of questions about specific uh, uh, demo-related questions if they want to see that. I think uh, given the time that we have left, we will be able to show you those specific scenarios that you guys are asking in a follow-up conversation um, since we are running out of time here at this point. I'm sure we got to most of the questions. If we didn't, we'll, there will be someone who's going to be following up with you. So thank you again for joining today's webinar. Thank you for your time. And um, we look forward to meeting with you or speaking with you soon. Uh, once again, thank you very much.